Terrific. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks, everyone, for joining me today. You know, with the FGS conference going on in Alabama and Hurricane Isaac going on everywhere else in the United States, it's really nice to see so many people here online. Now, looking at the answers to Jeff's poll questions, it's pretty clear that there aren't very many of us who have direct evidence to prove the parents for every one of our ancestors. In fact, it seems to be more the exception than the rule. So basically, we're all in the same boat, at least some of the time, and usually most of the time. We're trying to build a family through circumstantial evidence. Now, first things first, let's make sure we're all on the same page on one key question. What is circumstantial evidence? So let's look at this birth certificate from 1895 in the city of Chicago. And if the question that we're trying to answer is when, when was, let's see here, there you go. When was Benjamin Ernest Schreiner born? We've got the answer right away. It's July 4th, 1895 which might explain why this son of these German immigrants was named Benjamin Franklin Schreiner. But if the question that we're trying to answer is when was Benjamin's father born, we don't have a complete answer on this document. All this document says is that his father was 41. So if he's already had his birthday in 1895, that means he was born in 1854. But if he hasn't had his birthday yet, he would have been born in 1853. So the fact is, this document isn't going to answer the question by itself. It's circumstantial evidence. Or to use the word that genealogists tend to use, it's indirect evidence. So now that we're all using the word the same way, let's go on to that other poll question. Is this good evidence? And some people didn't seem to be quite so convinced that it could be more certain, satisfying, and persuasive than direct evidence. Even though we've got people like the US Supreme Court telling us that it is. So here's a little test for you. This little guy was photographed on his first birthday. And at that moment, you can tell that he was looking at something across the room. And let me assure you that food was important to that boy. What he was looking at was his first birthday cake. Now, you weren't there at his birthday party. You didn't see what happened. You didn't hear what happened. But is there any doubt in your mind, any doubt at all, who ate the cake? Now, all you've got here is circumstantial evidence. But you know who ate that cake. He did. And circumstantial evidence can give us that same type of confidence in our own family histories. So let's walk through one family's history and see whether circumstantial evidence alone can give us a family for Josiah Baker of Ellis County, Texas. Now, the only thing Josiah's family had when they were starting to find out who his parents were was a family Bible. One of the record pages said Josias was born on April 1st, 1787. His wife Nancy was born on August 20th, 1791. They were married September 7th, 1815. And it even tells us what Nancy's maiden name was, Nancy Parks. On the deaths page, the Bible tells us that Josias died on November 22nd, 1871. Nancy died September 5th, 1878. Now, let's stop right here for a minute and look at the first official government record that we can find for Josias. 
And that's the 1860 census. That census tells us that Josias was 73 in 1860 and Nancy was 69. If we do the math, match it up to what the Bible says, it looks good. That would be 1787 for Josias and 1791 for Nancy. It even tells us they were born in North Carolina. But remember the question we're trying to answer. It's who are Josias's parents? And this document doesn't tell us who his parents were. So now we all want direct evidence. We want that piece of paper that names the parents. So we're going to go off to North Carolina, we're going to look at the State Library and find out that birth records started in 1913. Okay, well, we know they were both born in North Carolina, so maybe they were married in North Carolina. And we go to the State Archives, we find the State Index as far back as 1741. And we find absolutely nothing. Nothing for Josias Baker, nothing for Nancy Parks. Okay, then we look for a Texas death record. We're going to go to the Texas Bureau of Vital Statistics. And death records didn't start until 1903. Okay, we're going to have to do this the hard way, but I'm not going to give up. There's a 1790 North Carolina federal census. We at least should be able to narrow down the Baker families that have a son the right age, right? 1,094 Baker families, and that's just counting the ones that are indexed correctly. It turns out that Baker is one of the most common surnames in all of America. It's not quite like Smith or Jones, but it's not much better. So how are we going to get Josiah's home from Ellis County, Texas, to his family in North Carolina? The fact is, this is pretty much a worst case scenario in terms of records. We simply need some help. And we're going to find it in the form of the GPS. Now, here we don't mean global positioning satellites. We mean the genealogical proof standard. And it's called a standard, but you know it's really a process, not a standard, and it's got five parts. The first part is to find all the records we reasonably can. And we do that to make sure we don't miss any critical clues. Now, I'm going to mention a whole lot of different kinds of records and there's a checklist in the handout that's got a lot of things to think of. But remember that in two weeks, Michael Haight is going to be doing a webinar here on this very step, this reasonably exhaustive search. He's got some great ideas, and I know I, for one, am going to be listening in. Step two of the GPS is that we cite our sources, and I can hear the groans from the whole group. Nobody really likes citations. We know we need them. We know we want to build a road map so that if we ever get lost, we can find our way back. And the road map lets everybody else see how we got to where we ended up to. But that's not the real reason to cite sources. And the real reason doesn't have anything to do with where you put the comma or where you put the semicolon. What's important about what we do when we take notes for a citation is that we stop and think. How good is this source? Who wrote it? How did that person know? Was he there? Or did somebody tell him about it afterwards and he just wrote it down? So when we're making our notes about the source for the citation, what we're doing is analyzing the records, and that's the next step in the GPS. We know we can't just accept everything that we find. I don't know about you, but I've been burned believing everything that I read on the Internet. 
so we need to check things. And while we're doing that analysis, every single time I've ever done it, I've come across conflicts in the data. And we need to resolve those. We need to decide what we believe and why. Finally, we reach and we write down a sound conclusion. And we write it down so that we can share it. And if you're like me, if I don't write it down, I'm going to forget it. So we write our conclusions. When we look at a case like Josias's, what do we mean by finding all the records that we reasonably can? And it always means that you start with what you know. In this case, we're going to start with what the family knows. And there are all kinds of possibilities, information that any family might have. Somebody in that family may have known these people. They may know what you're trying to research. They may have direct information, eyewitness. They need to be interviewed. Of course, there may be family Bibles. People write all kinds of genealogical facts in there. There can be memorabilia, and this is a really broad category. A diploma, a ticket stub, a souvenir from the 1893 World's Fair. Anything can provide a clue. Recorded family history can be as informal as notes on a scrap of paper, entries in a baby book, even a family tree chart that's up on your wall. We hope we've got family letters and papers. All of those tidbits, like Aunt Agatha passed last Thursday, or Mary Lou had baby Josh two weeks past, absolutely want that information. And we can always hope we have family photographs. Sure, we want the writing on the back that says who's who. But remember, sometimes it's as important to look at the picture and see what's there, what's in the photo that helps us figure out when and where it was taken and who the picture shows. Now, in Josias's case, remember I said this was pretty much a worst case? The only thing the family had was the Bible. Now, it does tell us pretty much what this family looks like. It has birth, marriage, and death dates for Josias and Nancy. It's got names of eight children. It has their birth dates. And it even has death dates for five of the children. But that worst case scenario, both of the sons died. We're not going to be able to trace this surname forward. And if we find a Baker candidate in North Carolina, we can't use DNA. We're dealing with daughters only. So at least, thank heavens, the Bible gives us the married names of two of the deceased daughters. Now, right here, we need to stop and analyze the data. We don't want to miss a clue by going too fast. So at every stage, we stop and we say, what do we know now? Using just the Bible and the 1860 census, we've got a pretty good start. We know when and where Josias and Nancy were born, when they died, how many children they had, what their names were. We can even chart it out as a family tree. But look at that upper left corner. We don't know a thing about Josias's parents. No first names, no mother, no dates, no places. And before we go on, let's ask the real question. Can we trust everything the Bible says? Remember that these entries started dated back in 1787, when Josias was born. And they end almost 100 years later when Nancy dies in 1878. And the Bible was published when? 1846. 